to view of Webb Rudy, uh, the social science department, world affairs professor, Audrey Meyer of the social science department who teaches sociology. And it's being done on November 10th in 1994 in the social science office. I'm Carol Pohl, I'm a sociologist from the social science department. And this is part of the 50th anniversary oral history project. Thank you, Carol. <laughs> okay. Here we are. Here we are. Here we are. So what I thought we'd do is start out maybe with saying what position you're in now, what positions you've had, and then open up more to, uh, you know, either one of you can start. Ladies first. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm Audrey Meyer. Uh, I'm now uh, retired, but I teach one course every semester as an adjunct just because I like FIT and the students and like to teach. Um, I came here in 1965. Uh, at that time, we had no, um, none of these buildings. We had one building, the C building, and uh, my, uh, one of my outstanding memories is Dean Brandris down there on the first floor when uh, uh, she had a dress code and when students or faculty or visitors would come into the building wearing slacks. She would come out of her office and direct them out of the building. This is a fashion school, and uh, no one, was, no changed. woman was to enter the building wearing slacks. <laughs> <laughs> and that was 65, and then it happened that before the end of that decade, a Barnard student walked down Broadway wearing Bermuda shorts, and that story was in headlines in the Daily News. That was the beginning of a big change. Um, at that time, uh, uh, President Jarby came in right after I got here and then uh, uh, was followed by Marvin Feldman. But uh, at the, during those first years, the union was being organized and the um, faculty association was being organized and procedures established for observations and promotions and uh, faculty policies, faculty initiatives. It was really a wonderful period um, to, to get started, quite different from my previous experiences. Uh, I came in to teach socio introductory sociology and, um, and to handle the community service program. We had at that time a program that required students to do volunteer services, <laughs> 30 hours at some time during their career at FIT. Um, many of them started out by pointing out to me that required wasn't volunteer, uh, <laughs> which we all understood, but we all thought it was good for them anyway. Um, and uh, I held on to the program because I did see that students, although they objected at first, almost all of them enjoyed the program once they got into it. And they, uh, they worked hard, and I had a list of a uh, couple of hundred agencies here in the city and out on Long Island and some in New Jersey, and we placed students. And then I would uh, have an interview with a student before the placement, and I tried to keep up with them while they were there, and I interviewed them afterwards. And most of them were very glad to have done it. Uh, it's a, it is a good experience, and I, we finally did end the program because of that contradiction, and uh, some students had made severe objections to it. But uh, there's the a student, lot. The students got a little active, I think, that they <laughs> yeah. began to say that this was not yes. really. Well, that was kind of the beginning of the student movement, right. too. They got right. involved in that and felt that they should be uh, independent and make their own rules. Now, it's interesting. So, I, I, I mm. marked that down in my memory, too, because I arrived mm. here just before Audrey in 1964. And right at the beginning, I was assisting Roy Daniels, the other sociologist, with this program. Oh, I, I was so? getting some release <laughs> yeah. time. Right. And so I always right. remember Roy saying that, this is Roy saying, I'm a sociologist, I'm not a social worker. Why am I doing this? <laughs> and he, he, was, he was very upset that the sociologist was supposed to take this. And, uh, but I, I remember that program very well. And I guess when you arrived, then I probably stepped out of it right. uh, because I was mainly working in sort of the administrative checkup, you know, did they really do 30 hours there and get letters from the agencies? 
because every yeah. student to graduate had to be verified yeah. of having completed 30 hours of community service. Yeah. Goes back, I believe, to the beginning of the school. I think I think it's one of the original so programs, was, yeah. as I understood it, yeah. uh, as Gladys Marcus uh, explained it to uh, to me. Yeah. What was the thinking behind it, in terms of uh, the original program? Do you know? I think to encourage students to get involved in the community, mm -hmm. that they were not just students, and when they went out to work afterwards, they wouldn't be just uh, professionals working, that they were also people in a community. It, it was widespread at Columbia uh, University at that time. They also had a very vigorous volunteer program. I think theirs was really volunteer. Mm. And students were going into poor communities and working. And I, I think that fueled the student movement, too, because they became very aware of disadvantages in those uh, areas and they uh, that was part of the the protest movement they wanted more justice in the world <laughs> and in New York and for everybody did ours become and, voluntary before it was dropped did it go from required no. to it didn't it just well, was completely well, dropped. well it did but it seems it, to me there was a time it, when we were still trying to encourage that's students right. to do yes, it yes there was there were yeah. a couple of years when <laughs> I really tried and then it uh, but it never succeeded no, once it right. wasn't required it was over <laughs> Could you imagine it, it today with all of our students working 30, 40 hours a week and say, hey, you've got to do community <laughs> service, too? <laughs> yeah. Obviously, it would not, it would not go. Uh, I'd like students. to comment on that on room 714, where we oh, all yes. started in, yeah. in the C building, <laughs> yeah. because that was the liberal arts office. So the three departments were all in there together, yep. maybe 40 faculty, just with a desk and a little cubicle, and of course, the three department chairs, uh, Gladys Marcus, I think Bill Leader was science, and Ernie Fleischman, Fleischer was uh, English. And, and uh, one and secretary, Miriam, Miriam <laughs> uh, Shanick at the front door was the secretary, right. apparently for everybody. I mean, she did my typing as well as anybody else's, I think. Uh, and oh, yeah. of course, Ernie, Ernie Fleischer had a voice something <laughs> like uh, Jackie Gleason. <laughs> and he never would go to see anybody, he would just yell. Right. And of course, the whole room would kind of go like this. Oh, there goes Ernie again. <laughs> and Dave Seiger would answer him. Poor Dave. <laughs> yes, Dave, Ernie, what do you want? Dave was also in English in, in the English department, and he and, and uh, Ernie didn't get along very well. <laughs> Dave would be a good one to interview, by the way. Yeah, you got would. him. You've got uh, him on the yeah. on the agenda. Sure. Yeah. But that was an um, experience, just having a little cubicle. If you wanted to have two students, you'd have to borrow somebody else's chair, you know. Well, that, my if you office, wanted to. I, I, when I was doing the community service program, I had an office so I could interview students. But after that, that was taken over for something else. And then I had an office that had a wash basin in it. And... <laughs> <laughs> and I think a coat rack and some other Yeah, well, that was that, that big was, room as you came right. in off to the side. Right. And I was thinking of that, too, because there was never enough room, especially in foul weather, for everybody's coats and galoshes and right. so forth. <laughs> and, you know, it was just Everything. a mess. And we finally, they gave us student lockers. They gave us lockers out in the hallway yeah. for, for each faculty yeah. member. <laughs> what do we do with our coats and stuff? <laughs> well, my office was always... Uh, I had people washing their hands. That's right. I remember the wash basin <laughs> there and a mirror so you could yeah. uh, trim yourself Putting up for makeup. your classes. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but um, actually, most of my uh, career as a sociologist, I've been interested in social issues. And most of my activity at FIT has had to do with social issues. Um, they, that period when I came in, the 60s, of course, was a big period of terrible unrest and it was exciting a lot of change was going on in the world or and in the United States and in Colo in uh, New York when the Vietnam War was on the Vietnam War was on there were peace marches and uh, there was the student protest movement the students at Columbia were occupying the president's office and and digging through the administrative files and FIT I guess was that was 1968 <laughs> right? right so the big the big student protest sure. yeah and uh, FIT was, I guess we were wondering what was going to happen here. Not but we were a little quiet compared to some oh, of those. I compared mean, to us them, students, yes. very professional oriented, did not. <laughs> I mean, they were involved in protests, but they didn't take over the president's office and I do things like that. I think there were some outside agitators that, who came in yes, and stirred uh, things up. That, that, and that, that and we did. Be. The students here did begin to print flyers and and put out some position papers. 
And well, we got very life. involved in, in the spring of 1970 when uh, Richard Nixon invaded Cambodia and then the Kent State uh, and massacre. And that, I mean, that spread every college in the country, including right. here. And we, we uh, right. stopped school and had a big auditorium a big meeting auditorium. and formed a committee that got into posters, got into protest marches. I remember yeah. some of them went up to Penn Station to hand out their protest right. students. Students. Did this students. Is all student well, initiated? Well, student and faculty. It was it was yeah, both. both. And and staff too, I I, right. I suppose. But the police chased them out of Penn Station. They did they, <laughs> they, they did not did not let them do that there. Um, <clears throat> the Soul Club was organized at that time and the a black student club and uh, they uh, and students put out a, a paper of their own black students called Black Rap. Oh, yes. Remember that? Yes. Uh, there was quite a, a lot of excitement. A lot, a lot of activity yeah. going on. And this yeah. was, I'd, uh, Audrey mentioned it because I was thinking of uh, what was the biggest change for faculty in my experience here. And I think this period, not so much because of the protest, but as you mentioned before, the union and the faculty association were both formed in the late 1960s, 67, 68, 69. And that, I mean, I had just started here in 64, but this was a momentous change because now uh, faculty were involved and uh, we, became, we became a college, I think. Prior to that time, uh, department chairs and deans made all the decisions. Yeah. I mean, the faculty was not involved at all. Right. And thinking of it even more was this, I think, is what brought the faculty together. Because up to that time, you practically you had no contact with art and design faculty and, and merchandising faculty and so forth. I mean, you met the liberal arts because you're all in the same room. But once you got these committees going, and then you begin to have faculty association meetings, but especially committees, that's where you really get to know people from other divisions and departments. Mm -hmm. this, this had a great impact on the faculty. Mm -hmm. that, that made it possible when, this, when the racial issue was so terrific for uh, the college to form an ad hoc committee on race issues. What do you I mean was the chairman racial, of that. Huh? What do you mean the racial issue? Uh, well, uh, justice for black students, and uh, I, uh, Dean Fuller yes. um, had written a, a paper making certain recommendations, and then uh, I became chairperson of the ad hoc committee, and we uh, tried to further those recommendations and wrote our own paper, and we were pushing for uh, more recruitment of black and other minority students and uh, more programming to for them and cooperation with Seoul, the black students organization to get uh, them into the college. And Ted we Cobb, recommended Ted Cobb, it just really yeah, reminds Ted me Cobb of Ted was Cobb. Oh, it wasn't affirmative action, they called it something else, uh, equal opportunity or Maybe. I whatever his office what was, but it. he was the first really affirmative action person that we right. had here. Yes. And, and we wanted remedial programs, and we wanted programs going into communities to help prepare students to get into college, and uh, college exposure programs. We recommended that students, high school students, be brought in to live at the dorm for two or three weeks just for the exposure. Um, they introduced that summer program, the, the uh, pre-, pre, pre Pre what pre pre PM or something they called it, yeah. but it was for students who had not met our requirements. They gave them a chance in the summer, taking two classes to see whether they could do college work. Right. It was a very interesting program. We even recommended not a integration of the student body and the faculty and more recruitment for minority faculty, and we suggested that the board of trustees also ought to be integrated. We should have some of. Uh, minority people on that um, and I think out of that student movement there you say we Audrey who do you mean we there was a group of faculty the members? committee the com the ad hoc committee on race it was formed by the administration or was formed by formed faculty? by faculty faculty association yeah. I think. it was the fact that we had the faculty association made it possible for us to form a committee and do all this which has been you know continuing uh, that Part of the bylaws say that the executive committee can appoint uh, ad hoc committees. Right. So when they're 
felt necessary. I know I was on one dealing with uh, tenure promotion proceedings, which uh, went on for about three years before we finally put together what is pretty much still the same system that's being used. Um. That reminds me, we had a very, very tough uh, struggle to get uh, student evaluations approved in uh, not only in the tenure and promotion proceedings, but also just in the classroom, you know, just so that faculty had to, uh, as we said, even if they got thrown away, at least the faculty was, was taking it. We don't think many got thrown away. But that was a very big battle. And I remember I was chair of the faculty association at that time, 1970, 69-70. And the vote, I'll always remember the vote because uh, we always did things by hand vote. And so at the end of the big discussion, we uh, had a hand vote on whether we we're going to institute student evaluations. And it was obviously very, very close. And we, you know, we tried several times to get this vote, yes and no. And then uh, I guess in, during the second time, I remember Kay Noyes, who was uh, in the English department, former, she was the originator, really, the first chair of the uh, faculty association, in the back of the room yelled out that somebody had both hands up. <laughs> and she thought this was so unethical. <laughs> and so at that point we said, okay, we're going to have to do a paper ballot really, yes, and we I will collect them at the door as you go out. So nobody comes back in until we've collected <laughs> all the ballots, which means one per person. And <laughs> that we did. And the vote was one in favor. It was like 56-55 or something like that. And a lot of people were screaming about being so close. And I said, it really wasn't that close because I didn't vote. If it had been a tie, I would have voted yes. So it's really uh, two, two, two <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> carries. Right. <laughs> Is this initiated by the Faculty Association? Yes, oh, yes. Student evaluations? Work. Yes, uh -huh. yes. Uh -huh. <clears throat> um, you know, at that time, the student newspaper was called the Fashion Collegiate. You remember oh, that? Ah, yes, yes. I had forgotten that, but that's right. That's and, right. Uh, <coughs> and and I think it came out every other week, and uh, and we there, there were a lot of letters in there, student protest letters and letters about racial issues, and I, I got into a little uh, uh, raucous with the. Um, with some students, I, I wrote a letter and they replied, and I wrote another letter, and it went on. That sounds like Audrey. <laughs> yeah, sounds like, uh, <laughs> right. uh, well, I think the next. Uh, well, I don't know. These things were all going kind of simultaneously, but then, uh, because I guess of the student movement and this uh, uh, awareness of, about the Vietnam War, and peace and justice and race, all those issues. Um, students were protesting and uh, complaining also about teaching, um, not at FIT but at other colleges. There's a lot of, of complaint that the courses were irrelevant and uh, the grading was arbitrary. And there were many thing, other things, but I think those were the main things that spurred us here and spurred the whole humanistic or affective education movement the movement to teach not just uh, uh, to the mind but also to the heart and to get make uh, contact with students and not just preach at them. And that uh, led to, a, in, at FIT, Marvin Feldman had come by then and he uh, sponsored this uh, humanistic education program at Glenmont, New York. Uh, which was also sponsored by the SUNY, um, but we all went up, up there, All who, I think who volunteered, we stayed five days. Did you go on really? that? I did not, no. Yeah, well, at that, uh, at that meeting, um, the emphasis was on uh, self-examination, um, honest uh, self-disclosure to each other, feedback from one another, comments and criticism about the college and what we liked and didn't like and and there were um, all kinds of we met in pairs and we, we got partners and then we met in groups and we were concerned with motivated learning structures <laughs> and uh, and the learning Sounds climate. Sounds like it's right out of an educational <laughs> school. <laughs> uh, 
Well, there what were, jogging? I, mean, I remember there were six dimensions to the learning climate. <laughs> At least, right? At least. <laughs> and how it affected achievement. Head, foot, and, arm, leg. <laughs> right. And Marvin Feldman came, and we, that night we had a fishbowl arrangement where everybody, it was a free-for-all. You could ask Marvin Feldman anything you wanted. And uh, he, w he was wonderful. He was just so good the way he answered questions and dealt with that whole thing. And I, I then I think out of that, there were other programs that grew out of that. And one of them was the leadership program that still runs by the Student Activities Office. Yes. How many people uh, attended the faculty one? Uh, it seems to me there may have been 30. Out of maybe. the faculty size of about, do you have any idea? Oh no! When when is this early seventies? It, uh, it must have been. It was with seventy-three. Feldman, seventy-three. Yeah. I'm not sure. Because uh, certainly we were growing. One of the yeah, things that's happened to social science, certainly, as with the rest of the college, is a tremendous expansion and growth in number of faculty and types of courses that are taught. Mm -hmm. Because in social science, of course, we used to be tied in with the art history. So it was a bigger department even in those days, uh, but half the department was art history. And when I arrived in 1964, before that time, uh, every student, and it was all two-year AAS programs, every student took sociology and psychology. No choices. Every, every, everybody took those too. And Gladys Marcus, when she brought me in, uh, introduced the first choice, or what we call selective. So my world affairs course then became one of the choices that they could take. And then within a few years, we had economics uh, with Jean Ellen Kiblin, and then we added philosophy, although that's still not a selective. Uh, so certainly in terms of uh, you know, uh, broadening the offerings in social science, and of course as the number of uh, students increased and as the upper division came in, there was a tremendous explosion in the number of courses and types of courses in, in, those, dis in those disciplines. Uh, I think that, that the humanistic education program did do a lot for the college, and Feldman did a lot for the college. He brought the faculty together in a way that it had never been. There had been pretty sharp divisions between liberal arts on the one side and the other divisions on the other side. And there were at, the, at that meeting, there were people from all divisions, and we all got to know each other. And uh, I think it did break down those barriers a lot and help to create a cooperative atmosphere, which was what Feldman really excelled at leading. Um, and then I think it affected people's teaching. It certainly affected my teaching. Uh, I began doing my special group testing after that changing my approach. <laughs> um, What's your special group test? The group test, I give a, a multiple choice test uh, to students individually and then they hand in their answer sheets. Then they sit together in groups of five or six and do the same test again, sharing an answer sheet and uh, discussing the questions. And. Uh, it's a, it's a really, it's a great experience uh, for them and for me because it's very gratifying to hear your students arguing about a sociology question <laughs> <laughs> and getting very excited about it <laughs> and wanting you to give them the answers. But I, I actually give a grade on that test, but it's just a fraction of the grade they get on their individual test. And I can always assure them that they won't lose anything because group tests um, putting all their heads together, they always come out with a much better grade than any individual, uh, with a few exceptions. So, I mean, people may get the same grade or close to it, but nobody loses on that test. And then you, you learn, even if you're teaching other people, it's a good way of learning. So, um, so what else has happened well, in our career? Th th <laughs> th th thinking back on the uh, <laughs> facilities and so forth, uh, it, it kind of amazing to look back and think that we had everything in the C building. It was Nagla Hall, which was all girls across the street, and the C building. And so I was trying to remember, I remember the uh, college shop was in the basement down near the gymnasium. And it was an FIT college shop. It was not a outside concern, it was our own shop. 
I forget the lady who was in charge of it, but she was there for many years. And the library. And the library. Yeah, that's what I really... Was that second or third second floor? floor? Second floor yeah. on the back side of the C building. Yeah. And I remember, it seems to me, the first time I went in there to see what they had in political science and world affairs, <laughs> that there were maybe uh, two, two, two partial shelves of, <laughs> of books. There was less than that <laughs> in sociology. <laughs> I, I mean, this was, this was a tiny, tiny library in those days, and they had very, very, very little. So one of the things we did try to do was to uh, you know, increase the library yeah. and the selection of books that they had, because it was obvious, well, that, you know, they <coughs> everybody, I guess, had used textbooks, and there was not much use of uh, library research and so forth. Well, you mentioned Negro all, all girls. What do you mean? The dormitory. Dormitory, dormitory but just just girls. girls, right? So there were no uh, places on on campus for boys, and of course, um, population was mostly <laughs> girls in those days, but it was also mostly commuter in those days. Yeah. So because you only had the one dormitory, right. so that has changed a great deal. One one thing I did th in thinking of changes in the student body. Uh, I have, I've certainly, in my classes, it, it comes through very, very strong, and that is the great increase in foreign students. And this, to in a world affairs class, this makes a big difference. I mean, if you have somebody from yeah. India, you have somebody from Japan, you have somebody from Germany in the class, then, or Israel, or Russia now, and so forth. This, I think we had, I don't know what the numbers were, but I think we had very few foreign students, uh, a few from Israel in the early days, and couple South Africans, I remember way back there, but compared to what we have now, it was a very, very small, cute. very small group. We were mostly New York City, metropolitan area students. Right. Long Island, New Jersey. Commuter students. And, and we mostly were girls? Mostly girls. Almost all girls. Yeah. Except in management, you'd have some boys in management, but that was about, that was about it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> you say most of them were uh, ethnically and in terms of socioeconomic status. You know, this was the first student in the first person they call in their family to go to college were they you know how would you describe I think it was mixed I, I, I think we've always had had some some of both I mean you some of some uh, students who come from middle class college right. educated families and some who are the first in their family I, mm -hmm. I think I think we've always had a mixture mm -hmm. along those lines although I think it's because being a professional school I mean there's a special interest for people to go here might be different than a community college. I think other, say, CUNY community colleges probably get a much higher percent of first from a family. But here, because we're so specialized, and so, you know, students can come from anywhere and say, I want to be a fashion designer. Yeah. Yeah. Although I think the majority did were people who came first generation. You believe so? I think the majority were. Yeah. We had, we always had some of the others, but it seems to me most of them, um, I think of my students from Long Island and New Jersey. Uh, they were people who were going to college. It was the first time in their family. And ethnically, what was the background of most of the students, and how would you compare it to today? Well, there were a lot more Jewish students. A lot more, my, yeah. A lot, lot more people. Jewish students than, and Catholic students. Um, and many more minorities in the sense of, of, of black Americans and Hispanic. Then and of course, the, now, oh, now, now, and and foreign students, yeah. so that you, you have a much greater mix now than Could you used to have. Explain what you mean by foreign students. Students who are international program. Mm -hmm. Students and who come from other countries. Right. Okay. When I say part foreign, of an international student or here as immigrants. They're here as immigrants. Well, sometimes it's hard to tell. I mean, to tell the difference. I mean, uh, having some experience with China, I know yeah. they Chinese say only about thirty percent of the students they send to the United States come back. So they come over as students, but then they stay. But uh, no, I, when I'm talking about foreign students, I'm talking about students who have come from Israel and are going back. Russia now, very f I don't think many of them are going back. But I've got, you know, you've got a lot of German students and Swedish students. They're all going back. So I think these, so actually foreign students. But, you know, sometimes it's hard to tell because a student won't identify themselves as a foreign student, and so you think, okay, Chinese American, Korean American. I don't, I don't know. You don't always know. What, what I noticed uh, in recent <coughs> semesters is there are more students. Um, uh, always, I, I have uh, European, Yugoslavian, Russian, and, uh, and then Korean and Israeli, 
but also students from the Caribbean who aren't from Puerto Rico, uh, but are from all all different countries. I, a student from Antigua mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. from Colombia and, uh, and, and Haiti. I've had Haiti, Haiti, Haiti students. Yes. From Jamaica, Jamaica. Mm -hmm. We certainly have students from Jamaica. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and South America, I mean, Colombia and Mexico yeah. and s some Central America. I've got a Guatemala now. So I think this is a lot more than we, than we used to have. Oh, yeah, it's um, an um, entirely uh, different student yeah. body, yeah. entirely in, different. In, in what way do you see entirely, in terms of ethnically, the countries ethnically. they come from? Yeah. yeah. Well, during the day, though, is it still mostly uh, young women coming from uh, high school who are here? Today? Yeah. <coughs> Because that seemed to be, from what I hear, most of the background of the students in the early point. There were kids, students who went from high school into college. I think days. mostly. I think mostly that's what we were getting in those days. Now I think it's still that's the predominance, I would say. But we have more uh, students who are either coming out of the industry, going back, and even some older students. But oftentimes, those that I'm calling foreign students okay. are older, too, that they, they yeah. have had other experiences. Yeah, I'm really talking about evening students now. That's I teach in the evening, so I don't know about day students anymore. <laughs> yeah. Evening the evening group has has always I only taught once in the evening, but has always been a different a different population. Mm -hmm. Because so many of them are working in the industry and so they I think they've always been an older group than the than yeah. the day students. Yeah, they're young adults actually yes. there. Yeah. Um, Another part of this history is the women's movement at FIT. I knew you'd get to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was very much involved in the women's movement. <laughs> and then there was the men's movement. You remember the men's movement? No, well, go I, don't ahead. I don't remember the men's movement either. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, in 1971, we had a one-day conference here called Dialogue on Women. and. Uh, I organized that and invited people from all around here, from professors from Columbia and League of Women Voters and New York Now and Florence Kennedy, who was a black character, <laughs> and uh, and people from Brooklyn College and Drew University, a lot of, of uh, outstanding people. We invited Gloria Steinem and Bella Absog came and gave the opening speech at that uh, dialogue. And uh, we had moderators from, uh, we had about 10 different sections uh, going on all day, and we had moderators from the faculty here from various departments, and, um, and students participated. We publicized it uh, among the students and faculty, and uh, had quite, a, quite an interesting day with a lot of activity. And, and it certainly raised awareness, I think, around the college <laughs> of the women's movement. Um, and we've done that in, in other fields, too, like nuclear weapons. Uh, we, we've had similar programs. Yeah, Fuller organized uh, uh, meetings about nuclear. Faculty weapons. initiated most of these programs? Students or? Yeah. yeah, I don't remember the one Fuller initiated. I was, I was thinking the one, maybe it was in, it was in the 1980s that uh, Audie up in uh, uh, Koppelman, oh, Audie Koppelman, Koppelman and, and I and a couple others were very much involved in, and we got we got a lot of uh, speakers and films and had uh, things going on all day long. We used to have a lot of assembly programs mm -hmm. and assembly programs that students were supposed to attend mm -hmm. in the big auditorium. Mm -hmm. So right. you might get three hundred or so students for a speech on uh, Vietnam or something. I think now with our little World Affairs lecture series where if we get 25 or 30 <laughs> students to hear an outside speaker, we say, oh, that's good. Yeah. But boy, in the old days, we used to they, well, they pack them the into the auditorium because, you know, <clears throat> some, I guess some attendance must have been taken because they, at least they were required to go. Well, I think teachers followed up on them afterwards yeah, where you I mean, had this reading. <laughs> um, I remember the. So I was a little high schoolish, I think. That was that, that was kind of uh, you know not yeah. not the usual that you find in college. I remember after the Kent State of, uh, event that we had the fe the, uh, the auditorium was overflowing, everybody was there. 
Well, I remember that went well because I was chairman of the faculty association and I chaired that meeting that, oh, that, did you? that morning <laughs> after Kent State yeah. in which with a lot of discussion and so forth, they formed a committee which did all these various act, uh, activities. In line with that too, I remember, because at that time, uh, President Jarvey had invited me, I was either the second or third chair of the, of the faculty association. I know Kay Noyes was first, I That's don't remember right. who was, I know Mike Silverstein followed me, but I'm not sure whether there was someone between Kay and me, I can't remember. But anyway, I know, I know that uh, Larry Jarvey, uh, for the first time when I was chairman, decided that the faculty association chair should sit in on his cabinet meetings. And therefore, every Wednesday morning, I sat in with all the big shots up on the ninth floor, which was, and that, that became a pattern that, uh, that uh, you know, Mike followed me and did the same thing, which was, I think, the first time that an ordinary faculty member had any input at the very, I mean, you know, division leaders and chairs and deans and so forth, but here, here I was an ordinary faculty member just happening to have been president, you know, chair of the, of the committee. Uh, it was, I was thinking of that experience, that's when I first got to know Shirley Goodman, because she attended yeah. these, these ca cabinet meetings. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that, that turned out to be very fortunate because within a couple years, Larry Jarvey retired and uh, Shirley Goodman became acting president. And uh, I was mm -hmm. chair of the faculty search committee for the new President. There was also a student search committee and there was a board of trustees search committee. Andrew Goodman from Bergdorf Goodman was the chair of that. And so between the four of us, the student leader and Shirley Goodman and Andrew Goodman and myself, we, we kind of put together that search which we all very happily uh, thought about afterwards as having brought Mr. Feldman here and having you a, did a brought, good brought, job. Brought, brought, brought <laughs> Andrew Goodman, when I saw him other uh, later times, he, he would always say that, hey, we did a good job, we didn't did, we? Sure <laughs> did a good job. I think we did. I just add to that then that in this what? recent presidential search committee, uh, because I had been on that one, uh, they thought they wanted to have some continuity, so I was the one piece of continuity. They invited oh, yeah. me to participate once again in the uh, search that followed uh, Feldman. What, what year uh, did Feldman come? About 72, I think. 72. Some, somewhere, somewhere in there. 72, 73. Yeah. It was just what about was that background? time. What was his background? Why was he selected? What was well, he'd been in the office <laughs> of the president in uh, Office of Economic Opportunity in vocational education, had also been in the Ford Foundation. President, over president of the con country. Yeah, yeah, Nixon, Nick, Nixon, Nixon's uh, Office of Economic Opportunity. So he, w he came under the White House staff. He was part of the White House staff. And uh, he had also uh, a, a very fine record at the Ford Foundation in dealing with uh, especially vocational education in African countries and other, other countries. So he was already quite a spokesman for what he always called vocational education. We used to, we call it professional education, but we were talking about the same thing. Mm -hmm. Did he have some military background? Well, he came from West Point. He was a graduate of West Point. Oh. You're right. Yeah, he's a okay. graduate of West Point. Mm -hmm. And he taught a little bit. That was the one thing that we thought was perhaps a little weak in his background. He didn't have much teaching experience. A little bit, I think, at San Francisco State or something in mathematics, as I remember. But uh, he made up for that problem. That was easy. <laughs> <laughs> Although I would say that we had quite a struggle with him at the beginning when he insisted on calling liberal arts general education. Okay, and sure we went that. into yeah. a firestorm over yeah. that, that this is not general education. And then we battled back and forth, and he finally came around and went along with the liberal arts. Right. So I yeah. think we, Gladys worked on him very hard to make that, uh, uh, you know, what we meant by liberal arts as being liberating. And he then, I think, kind of took that on as one of his major themes, that we're yeah. liberating students so that they can become, uh, you know, professionals and go into whatever <laughs> field they want. Yeah, and the industry wanted people with liberal arts background. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, we should really say something about Gladys Marcus. She was... Well, uh, she, she was uh, <laughs> Mrs. Liberal Arts yeah. here. She, uh, she was chairman of social science when both of us came aboard. Right. Uh, 
Uh, she had previously taught in social science when Mary Jones, I guess, was chairman of the social science department. Mary Jones became the student affairs, director of student affairs, mm -hmm. uh, like Nancy Grossman now. Mm -hmm. And then Gladys took over as chair and was... And Gladys had her little office in the C building on that that same office that oh, we way all over in the shared. corner, way over in the mean, corner. She had there. a door to her office. Did she have a door to her office? I've forgotten <laughs> yeah, that now. Yeah. That was to try to keep out some of Ernie Fleischer's uh, yelling. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but Gladys was, she was in close touch with all of us, and she, oh, yes. she, uh, she pumped for language uh, program. And for, so. and for foreign international, language. international foreign language, she, she brought in very, very French, uh, Lucien, yes. De Wolf, and uh, and really was gratified to see that begin to grow because she had wanted that for years, and she also wanted an international emphasis in all the courses. She was always stressing right, that right. for sociology courses. And, uh, she others. was a wonderful lady, but I always remember the first year I was here, she put me through such a task. <laughs> it was the first teaching yes. I had ever done. And uh, so she brought me in, and that first semester, she sat in on every one of my classes. Not, 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 not every class, but a whole, <laughs> oh, you know, every, oh. every week she would come and hear what I was talking on this subject or that subject or the next subject. And I remember my first students at, uh, towards the end of the semester, they told me that I was getting much better because my knees weren't shaking anymore. <laughs> I knew my knees were shaking when she was there. <laughs> That's right. She did all the observations. Ooh, yeah, but this, 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 this was like uh, all, all the time. I mean, she was there all the time. And I thought, wow. Well, by the time <laughs> I, I hope do. this doesn't go on forever. I'd never, never be able to survive this job. <laughs> but after the first semester, she let me go. So uh, I think she was too busy when I came. So when you were very fortunate. <laughs> <laughs> she sat in a few times, but not that. I mean, much. she never never said anything nasty. I mean, she never she never said anything nasty. Oh, the first time, I think the first class, she she thought was a disaster, and I knew it was a disaster. <laughs> but I mean, I was really shaking. Uh, but after that, you know, she was just kind of encouraging and so forth, and she she would just sit there. But I mean, I always knew she was going to be there every week. You know, and, uh, but she was a wonderful lady and uh, encouraged us was. all to do whatever we could and. Uh, New courses or go to conferences, keep up to date. Right. Uh, wonderful lady, wonderful yeah. lady. We all miss her. <clears throat> that is true. I wish she were here to see what's happening. <laughs> 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 I wish she were here, especially to for the uh, the publication of Ruth Rubenstein's book. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, the fiftieth would be. The, she she yeah. she'd enjoy the fiftieth too, and so would Shirley Goodman. That's uh, too bad they're both not here. Yeah. Um, I wanted to say something about my slideshow that I did. <laughs> <laughs> Your slideshow. <laughs> in uh, 1975, this was. Gladys asked me to put together uh, some sort of a program on women. And uh, I think this was in celebration of Women's Month or Women's Week or something that year. And uh, I started in a small way, and it grew, and it grew. And uh, I worked with Sheila, I forgot her last name, she was in the English department. Um, but um, it was to be a, a history of the emancipation of women. And before it was over, I had 350 slides. Um, we had costumed students on the stage, we had a fashion show, there was poetry, we got um, actresses from around New York to volunteer to read the script and to narrate, and uh, there were skits, and uh, 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 we taped all of this and then presented it with lighting. <laughs> it was a big event uh, on the stage. Uh, and it went from uh, Mary Wollstonecraft all the way to uh, Bella Absog <laughs> in the present time, um, and talked about the changes in women's roles, and we emphasized all the people. We even passed out the Declaration of Independence for Women that was developed at the Seneca Falls meeting in 1848. Passed out copies of that to the uh, to this uh, audience. Um, 
<clears throat> and then we organized somewhere along the way, the Women's Awareness Club was organized. It was always a struggle. I, I, all the clubs, student clubs I've ever been involved in have been a struggle to get people to participate and to come to meetings. Um, they're busy with clubs that have to do with their careers and it's very hard to keep a liberal arts club of any kind going. Um, I did, uh, the last year I was here, 1985, I finally got a few students who were very interested, very active. Uh, Sharon Weiner and Kelly Andrews were great girls who um, uh, developed a uh, sexual harassment survey and a quest, three page questionnaire was given out to 400 students or more. We got back uh, 300 and something of them and um, they answered all these questions about sexual harassment. They had all experienced a lot of it in their lives, mostly on the street or at work. Uh, very few reported any such thing at FIT. A few at school and very few at FIT. Um, and then in connection with uh, the Women's Awareness Club, we often had tables and, um, and literature and organizations like NARAL or Planned Parenthood giving out information, um, uh, pro-choice, and, uh, and we had tables uh, uh, promoting the ERA. Remember the ERA? Yes. <laughs> um, and uh, we had, I remember Mary Calderon came once to talk about uh, uh, women and sex and, and gays and straights, uh, but I think that may have had to do with the counseling committee. I'm not sure that that was part of the women's awareness. Um, in the meantime, the, the course, when I first came here, Gladys had asked me to, to create a course on marriage and family, which I did. And then uh, during all this period, I changed the revised the course and, and changed the title to Sex Roles, Marriage and Family and Transition. That's the title we still have. Increased the enrollment, <laughs> I think. Yes, it is. Oh, yes. <laughs> the sex roles part increased the enrollment a lot. <laughs> Why? Are you saying ironically it did, or did it really change it, the enrollment? Oh, I think it did increase the enrollment some. They weren't yeah. thinking of People. gender role, or were they thinking of sexuality? Um, I think it caught their eye in, I in, think the, in the catalog. Sex yeah, caught their I think their eye. eye that's, right. <laughs> that's what it was. Roger Malera once told me I ought to change my China and Japan course to Sex in the Orient, and he said then you'd have no pro no problems <laughs> getting <laughs> students. <laughs> yeah. well, I couldn't quite couldn't quite put that one over. But, uh, I was thinking back on the uh, uh, department when we came in, because combined with the art history. We had a number of older art history professors, Irene yeah. Craig and Henry Lemming and Sibylla oh, yes. Simonides, and <laughs> there were a number of, in a sense, you know, the, the generation before most of us. And uh, but I don't think in social science because I think Lou Stoller and Roy Daniels were just we're about just the about two about senior, into. and they were not that much older. They were about the same age as us, I guess. Yeah. So actually, we did not in social science have a, a real carryover of what we might call old timers. Uh, we all became old timers <laughs> as time went on. But I mean, we kind of the department kind of grew, uh, you know, uh, uh, so that Lou Lou has been the oldest old timer for for a long well, time. I guess. Remember those two art historians? They were, um, that they exchanged. Yeah, that was Henry and, and Sibylla. Henry yeah. and Sibylla. <laughs> Each one was here one semester. And, and then the, went to Europe. And the went to Europe semester. the other semester. And so they were they, on the same line. Yeah, it was, it was the same line, but they each had it for one half of the year. Yeah, yeah that was an interesting <laughs> arrangement. How did things work with art history? How did it happen to be combined in a department? I'm sure that, you know that was long, long before, because it used to. It was art history, sociology, psychology. That that was the department. That was the liberal arts. That was division. it. <laughs> so that was. That was the whole liberal arts. No, that was the whole social science. Oh. 
the whole social science. The whole science, social science. Right. Then science but so that, science. that, you know, made a manageable department, I suppose. But then when we began to expand into political science and economics and philosophy, then, and of course we got more sociologists and more psychologists and right. so forth. So that then it became just too big a, too big a department. But, uh, you know, I mean, we always in department meetings had different viewpoints. The art historians had th their viewpoint and the rest of us had, I mean, we were social scientists and they were more historians and uh, it was... Uh, well, we didn't split until quite recently. No, no. It's uh, partly, I think, a financial. I think there's a financial uh, in question yeah. in splitting. Uh, I know another chair and also secretary and uh, that, that kind of thing. So, uh, but I mean, we got along all right. We observed each other's classes, even though we didn't know right. much about <laughs> what, right. what they were doing, but we so could much. tell whether they were getting something across, I guess. So it, 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 it seemed to work. It, it was sometimes right. a little frustrating when an art history historian observed your class. <laughs> <laughs> you're never quite sure what kind of comments you're going to get. Right. But, uh, yeah. I do remember some of the summer schools, too, because we didn't have AC in the old days. And summer school, I don't know, you teach many summer schools? I did teach yeah, summer schools. Yeah. So, sometimes they were kind of brutal, as I remember. <laughs> when we get a hot July. <clears throat> oh, yeah. I, uh, well, one of my memories is teaching in the knitting room in the basement <laughs> with the machinery all around. <laughs> we had a little corner in the room, and the rest of it was machinery. And it was <coughs> cold down there. So that was very fortunate. Yeah, we very cold. cold. Because they hadn't expanded to these buildings. That's the right. That was still in the sea. What were these yeah. buildings before? They were office buildings. That's a these good question. <laughs> what was here? Huh? <laughs> what was here? What was here? <laughs> well, I got to think about that for a while. I don't remember it now. I don't remember. What I was here? Uh, they must. They must have been. It must have been office buildings and um, maybe. A, I don't think there were any apartment buildings. I remember stores along here, I think, at that corner. <laughs> I, yeah. I really don't remember. That's, that's no. a very interesting question. How many times we walk by them and don't remember what they were? That question comes up a lot. I look at, really? at um, well, I look in my own neighborhood at, at a block and realize, you know, these are new stores, and I try to think what was there before. It's, you don't remember. I, I haven't either. asked the question before because it hasn't come up, but I will start asking it. Because nobody has said, I remember when A yeah, was this, and nobody yeah, has yeah. said it. So it's like, mm. they remember the C building, they remember High School of Needle Trades, but they don't remember what these yeah. buildings were before. Well, so I have to really ask the interesting, question. Yeah. It's interesting, yeah. It's over on that yeah. corner where the library is now. <laughs> I don't know. I, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't remember that either. Hmm. I'm pretty sure these were office buildings over here where the... Uh, the, that dormitory yeah, is. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. One thing I do remember is we used to have the commencement out in the backyard. Oh yes, and that, that was, was nice. really very interesting. Everybody mm -hmm. praying that it didn't rain. From yeah. God. But uh, I mean that that was a co cozy little arrangement where yeah, you'd squeeze like all the chairs out there <laughs> and so forth. Of course, so. the backyard wasn't what it is now either. <laughs> it was the C <laughs> building backyard. <laughs> yeah, it was the C building backyard. And, uh, and it was open, you know, yeah, you it was could open. come in that way in the morning if you wanted to. Right. I was trying <laughs> to think, was it, was it, there was <clears throat> some green there, or maybe it was mm -hmm. potted green, but no, I, I, I do remember. Yeah, I think there was some, yeah, green, there was some trees, there trees and so forth there. Yeah. So I it remember it as nice out there when the yeah, yeah. commencement. The commencement was pretty good there. What about but leaking? obviously we outgrew it. <laughs> <laughs> Linkages to the various industries in, in terms of social science form, did you have much Linkages to other unions or industry, you know, what they call the, the industry, the apparel industry in any way? Not, not in political science or world affairs. We, we, for many, many years, we used the United Nations a great deal. I know in my world affairs class, I always had a simulated United Nations, two meetings, one early and one late. And the students all had to go to various missions. We used the Israeli Arab dispute as the focus. And they represented different countries on the Security Council or the UN and actually went to those missions and got speeches and information. So we, we tied in with the United Nations. Uh, through Asian studies, I've tied in a great deal with various organizations. State University uh, of New York had an Asian Studies Faculty Council, 
which I helped found back in the late 1960s. And then uh, there's a Mid-Atlantic Asian Studies and a, and, a, and a New York Asian Studies group. So most, most of my outside contacts have not been with what we call industry, but more with the discipline, with, with uh, uh, you know, the fields, fields of study, professional associations. Could you talk a little about why you developed the uh, China and Japan course and the linkages? Um, you know, why well, you developed the course? And I'd, I'd been very interested in China and Japan ever since graduate school back in the 1950s. And so I just, you know, I kept pursuing it, and I have continued to pursue it. I had never visited them by that when I started that course. It was very much, and I know a number of faculty members took the course, and it, uh, uh, a lot of our faculty, especially in art and design, took courses here because they, in those days, were required to finish their degrees, and they were, you know, to, well. Uh, Yes, that the ones that took courses here would have been doing that, but many of them had to go out and t get master's degrees as well. The requirements were were pretty pretty uh, pretty firm, and uh, so some of the faculty who had started maybe with just an AAS were completing their BS or BAs, and uh, that made me think that you know the courses I first started teaching it was very historical which was the way I had studied China and Japan. And as the years have gone on, it's become much more, or certainly much more contemporary, but also much more cultural, in which I'm trying to show a civilization rather than just a history, a history, of, a history of a country. But- uh, You take the students on a trip there, do you? We, well, we ha there is, there is a, a travel course to China which has never gotten off the ground because there's never been enough student interest in it. Uh, it is expensive, and uh, I think our students, if they want to take a travel course, prefer to go to Europe. And th those those courses seem to be much more appealing than right, the art, ones going to the Orient. Art history courses, yeah, or art yeah. literature, or drama courses. So I, I have a feeling that that course will probably never never take off. It's I did it for three years. I offered it, and it's it involves a tremendous amount of work, making arrangements in China for faculty at different universities to give lectures as well as making the arrangements to stay at different universities. And after three years and then, you know, make all the arrangements and then cancel it, I decided uh, this doesn't make any sense because there's, there's, very, there's very little interest in it. So I don't, I don't think that course, that course will ever go. I never got involved with the industry. Um, I did do field trips, but uh, more to uh, Rikers Island. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I've always been interested in crime and prisons. And we used to have yeah. Isabel, right? Isabel Lundberg was one of our yes. part-timers who right. taught at Rikers Island. Yes, yes. she did. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I took students there. I tried many times to arrange field trips, and I took several field trips, but that, again, was very hard to manage because of student schedules. You just couldn't get students together for a whole afternoon to go anywhere. <laughs> Um, so I always ended up with a little handful of students. Right, right. <laughs> I, I kind of gave up on field trips. Um, what I did instead was to get um, ex-cons to come and speak to us from the Fortune Society. Um, and the Fortune Society is that organization that helps ex-cons when they come out of prison. And uh, Carol had police here last week. We thought they, know, thought they were coming to take her away. Carol has police. <laughs> I have the prisoners. <laughs> Do you ever get together and see if they know each other? <laughs> but uh, uh, one one time, it's it's very revealing, very educational to have an ex-con come and talk to your students. And some of these people who came were really actors. Talk about were, life were, inside, or how they got how they got involved. Well, their whole background their whole and background. how they got arrested and why. Yeah. And and one man I remember said that um, he got arrested for something he didn't di do, but he said it didn't matter because I'd done a lot of other things. I, so didn't I didn't get, get arrested. <laughs> 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 but he and he was also on a, a one time with. Um, Isabel Lundberg, who was also interested in this kind of thing, uh, we organized um, a meeting in, with the media, and the, they videotaped the whole program. We had three people from the Fortune Society, two men and a young woman, 
uh, who in the course of the program, somebody asked her how old she was. She asked them to, uh, what they thought, and they thought she was 20 or 22. She was 15 years old. <laughs> <laughs> Very sophisticated. Uh. <laughs> um, but we still have that videotape and it's available for use. <laughs> we, we've taken um, a lot of students mm -hmm. to uh, lectures outside, especially luncheon lectures, but sometimes early evening lectures. And to some extent you get the same, you know, ten students say they're going to show up and they'll go, and so you tell the people that, you know, we'll have ten and then, you know, <laughs> about four, come right. something like this. <laughs> yeah. But so sometimes, especially to the Foreign Policy Association, uh, who had, uh, we never got the luncheons because that cost fifty dollars, but we used to go to luncheons to hear the speakers. And uh, we, we got quite a few students going to some of those. Center for Communications has very often uh, lectures on human rights and uh, international um, uh, re journalism reporting and so forth that we get students to go to also. But things that you do right here at FIT work much better. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> we have had uh, um, another area, social issues, that I was interested in has always been population and environmental issues. Um, somehow, I took, a, I took a couple of courses in college um, at the University of Missouri on population. They impressed me deeply, and I understood population. And then I came across um, Fairfield Osborne's book, Our Plundered Planet, which came out in 1948. And it laid out, really, the whole story about the destruction of the environment and the planet. And from then on, uh, I had those as major interests. And nobody else was really talking about it. And um, uh, it was not a popular issue. But um, I talked about it in my classes always. And then in 1970, enough interest had developed. We had Earth Day in 1970, and that well, it was also in connection with the Vietnam War. We had a, a, a mannequin from the other one of the departments and dressed her up as a bride and put a gas mask on her. And we had her <laughs> the entrance to the college and had a big program that day with a lot of uh, of uh, organizations here. We must have had 20 or more organizations with tables and information being handed out. And uh, uh, a film on environment that day and a lot of material about nuclear you say war. Me. You mean you and the students? Or you no, and Ellie, the uh, Ellie Applebaum was in the science department oh, then, and so she and I did this together. Okay. And uh, it, was, it was quite a, a big event. Um, I remember that we were referred to as ecology freaks rather contemptuously, <laughs> but uh, when Rika, Rika was in well, Rika was wasn't here that year. She wasn't year. here yet. She came. Oh, that year. She came that year. She I believe. came that year. Yeah, oh, oh. and then from then on, Ellie uh, Applebaum left, and Rika and I then right. have worked together a lot on environmental. We uh, we tried to give a we gave a course one year, um, interdisciplinary course on. Uh, sociology and ecology. Hmm? What Biology, Biology, ecology, what did we use? Ecology and sociology. Yeah. And uh, it, it was a pretty good course, I think, but uh, it wasn't continued. Um, but then uh, Rico became especially active, and, and uh, I worked with her. And we had, uh, we had peace marches in the 70s, and... Uh, and uh, Oh, she had a big auction, Recycle Your Relics, and about recycling, and we sold UNICEF cards, and they made, the science students made terrariums. She, it was the Life Club she established. And she, her club and the Women's Awareness Club worked together some. We went on a camping trip once. I think she went many times on camping trips. And then she organized a little group called The Pod, which continued this interest in environmental issues. You know, you were talking about trips. Have you noticed a change in the n number of hours the students work outside of uh, uh, going to college? I, mean, it, I think there's a great, a great increase, but I, I, I don't notice it so much in, uh, unless a yeah, student mentions it. You know, yeah. a student mentions it, because I think today, 
I don't know, but I would presume a majority of them are working, it seems. But that wasn't true. I don't believe that was true in, in no, the past. Not, no, not no. near as much. Students no. who did those voluntary uh, uh, program, they, they weren't working outside. No, I think that that's it's really a big change, I think, yeah. in the student body. Uh, yeah. And that's that. all since the 70s, really. But I think that's, that's probably pretty common uh, across the country, in big cities mm -hmm. especially, I guess. Mm -hmm. You know, I was thinking one thing that's really changed. It, it was a, a time when the uh, faculty student basketball game was a, was a very, very big oh, event. Yes, I used to go to that. Yeah, I mean, people <laughs> used to go to it. No, nobody goes to it anymore. And in fact, very few faculty participate anymore. So it's really a staff 